Well, good morning, everybody. We still have a number of people that are jumping into our webinar here. So I'm going to wait just a couple minutes to get rolling. Hey, I'm still waiting uh, just a couple of minutes for the um, for the others to attend. I can uh, I can see attendees coming in right now, so I'm just going to wait for another minute or two, and uh, then we'll get um, we'll get started. Well, a question jumped in here. Will I be providing the slides for future reference? Uh, yes, we will. Um, after these webinars, we, um, we do record them, we do save them off, and we will put them up on our website under our content. So I would say give it, um, give it maybe a couple of days and go uh, hit the website up at the top. Uh, there'll be a content drop down. Uh, now there's a there's a webinar drop down also. Content has a lot of our uh, articles and presentations that we've done, and then there's a webinars uh, drop down that you can go to and uh, take a look for this one. Okay, I would say uh, let's go ahead and get rolling here. Um, I got about 11.33 my time. We still have some people that are, uh, that are currently showing up. But um, I just want to say hello. Welcome. Thanks for attending. Happy New Year. What a great way to start 2017 with some uh, performance optimization tuning tips. So this is, uh, these webinars are just a great way for, uh, for us at Themis to stay in contact with people in the industry. Uh, we're happy to share some of our knowledge uh, as we present these, uh, these webinars um, with everybody. Many of you attending here today um, know me. Maybe, maybe many of you do not know me. Uh, I, um, I'm one of the trainers, consultants at uh, Themis. I tend to, uh, to stay on the development side more. Um, I do a lot of the developer classes and programming classes um, for Themis. I do a lot of the SQL classes, advanced SQL classes. I do a lot of the performance and tuning classes specifically for developers. So I grew up as a developer, uh, wrote many, many programs over the years, still write a lot of programs today. And um, one of the things that I found over the years of, um, of experience and what I still find today that there's, there's many things that we can do as developers to get queries, programs, applications to perform better. Uh, it's not always a DBA job to get things to run better. Um, us developers 
have a lot of things that we can do without ever getting DBAs or systems personnel, you know, involved. So a lot of the a lot of the talks that I do at uh, some of the DB2 user groups and North American European um, DB2 conferences tend to be developer related. Um, I'm all about trying to get developers uh, a little bit more empowered. Uh, so in this webinar today, I think you'll uh, there'll be some takeaways um, for everybody that's attending. Uh, this is a good webinar, not not only for developers and programmers, but for analysts, testers, really even end users, uh, any kind of uh, anybody on sites that that tends to write a lot of SQL. We all hit times where our SQL may perform okay. Sometimes it performs really well. Sometimes it may not perform that well. Or maybe for a programmer, we have programs that, that may not perform that well. So this uh, this uh, webinar today is going to hit, you know, a number of topics that we as developers um, should think about and uh, take away some thoughts and uh, some actions that maybe you can put in place to help get things to run faster. Okay, so I'll try my best to get some of the questions towards uh, the end of the webinar. There is some um, an area you can submit some questions. Um, I'll try to pay attention to those as I roll along. Any questions not answered, uh, you can please uh, email me. I'll be more than glad to get back with you in the next uh, day or two. Uh, presentation will be added to our FEMAS website under the webinar at the top of the page. There's our website again www.themisinc.com. Okay, well, we have a lot of objectives today, a lot of different uh, topics that we're just going to touch upon, and uh, hopefully at, at the end you're going you're gonna to have some ideas of what makes queries, programs, and applications perform poorly, uh, what we can do to get them to run a little bit faster, uh, better understand what SQL optimization is, uh, something called table scams when, uh, with queries, uh, what do we do when we see a table scan? Typically, we do not want table scans in queries. We want to be able to uh, process, have our queries being processed by the use of indexes. So when we see a table scan, what, what should we do? Um, there's different types of predicates. A predicate is one of the statements in our where logic, where last name equals Andrews and first name equals Tony. Each of those statements is called a predicate in the SQL language. Each predicate gets assigned a certain type from uh, from the optimizers. And uh, we're going to talk about those a, a, a little bit because some of the predicate types are not very efficient and some of them are very efficient. Uh, what's an indexable and non-indexable predicate? Uh, we're going we're gonna to take a look at some of those and uh, understand what those are all about. And what's meant by indexable and non-indexable? And data statistics, you know. One of the, uh, the important things, you know, when, we, when DBAs create the tables and we as developers, we load the tables, you know, with all this data, the uh, DBAs come along and they execute something called run stats. And that, uh, that gives DB2 a lot of information in the catalog tables uh, on, on some cardinalities based on the table. How many rows are in the table? What's the uniqueness, the cardinality of each column in the table? Uh, and those things are like extremely important when it comes to performance and tuning. In a production environment, those statistics are usually pretty well up to date. In our test environment, sometimes they can be really, um, really out of whack um, because uh, DBAs typically do not run the run stat utility in our test environments. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in an upcoming slide. And just uh, some steps, general steps, you know, when it comes to tuning a query or program. Where do, where do I go? Where do I start? What do I do when I have a query or a program that's just not performing very well? And, um, you know, a few standards and guidelines we'll talk about. All right, so what are some of the key areas that cause performance issues? Well, bad coding practices, that's, uh, that's very common. Poorly coded SQL. You know, the SQL language is a great language. It's pretty easy to learn. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can write a predicate in uh, the SQL language. Some of the predicates that you code in, the, in SQL on these relational database platforms are not very efficient. Although logically they work, they're just not very efficient. So which ones are efficient and which ones are not efficient? And how do we know which ones are efficient and which ones aren't? Um, there are manuals, there are SQL uh, statements in the manuals that kind of tell you um, 
about all the different ways you can write a predicate in the SQL language. On the ZOS uh, platform, um, they get laid down in what's called a stage one and stage two category. On the LUW side, they get uh, they get what's called sargeable and non-sargeable, non-sargeable and residual predicates. So they have a few different categories there on the uh, LUW side. We want the stage one predicates on ZOS. Um, we want the sargeable ones on the LUW side. Those tend to be uh, the, the most efficient. Bad coding practice. Sometimes we, uh, we get into SQL statements that they're doing more than it needs. Sometimes I'll get into queries that I go in and, and help tune on uh, projects, and I see extra tables in there, extra sorts going on. Uh, you know, we all copy and paste, you know, from other uh, programs and other queries that, uh, that we've coded or others have coded, and sometimes there may be extra tables in there uh, that just really weren't caught, but our output is okay. But that extra table is causing a lot of extra work and a lot of physical I.O., you know, behind the scenes. So pay attention and make sure you only have the tables needed in there. And if there's any sorts going on, there's a lot of things in the SQL language that can cause sorts. Obviously, an order by may cause a sort, doesn't always. The word distinct, group by, oftentimes causes sorts. Union versus union all causes sorts. Sometimes when joins are taking place, one of the tables uh, gets sorted in a, in, a, in a way that helps the join process a little bit better. So how do I know if sorts are going on? Well, you don't really know if sorts are going on unless you do a DB2 explain, and that will tell you. Just by the fact that you see an order by in there does not mean that there's a sort going on. The optimizer oftentimes does what's called sort avoidance. When it sees a distinct or a group by or, or a order by, for example, it may not do a sort, depending on if there's indexes that, that kind of match what's being uh, distincted or grouped or ordered. So pay, just pay attention to our SQL. Make sure we don't have extra tables. Make sure we don't have sorts in there. Make sure we're only getting the columns back that we need. Okay? Sometimes extra columns can cause a different optimization path. Sometimes one extra column can cause a, a, a extra or a different optimization path. Extra columns at times can cause extra I.O. behind the scenes. So it's really important as we do walkthroughs, sometimes we'll tell developers, look, you have, you have one extra or two extra columns in your select that you're not using. It seems kind of simple, but at times it can be extremely powerful. Access paths. So how do I know what the access path is and what is an access path? You know, it's the way that the DB2 optimizer is going to physically go after and gather the data for our result set. Got a multi-table join. What, uh, what table does it start with? Uh, what table does it join to next? What's the join method? Is it using indexes on these tables as it's processing through them? Are there any sorts going on? If it's not using an index, it's doing what's called a table scan. That means it's scanning the whole file of that, of that physical um, table. They have 128 million rows. It's scanning through 128 million rows. So we need to watch out for our access paths, and that's where it takes a little bit of knowledge on DB2 explains. Um, we're going to get into explains a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, my feelings are: I think every DB2 developer, every DB2 power analyst, um, and end users that are writing queries out there should should be knowledgeable in the DB2 explain, at least to the point where we can see some obviously some obvious things going on behind the scenes. The explain can be quite simple at times. Other times it can be pretty involved. Um, I know we at Themis, we have a couple of different explain classes um, for developers that tend to be at the top of our DB2 list of top five or ten classes that, uh, that we do each year. Um, and uh, developers come out of there and they're, uh, they're well versed in, uh, in the DB2 explain. Poor index design. Um, you know, this is... Uh, this is uh, for developers, you know, you need a tool to know what the indexes are on these tables that you're coding against. I would say probably 99% of the time when we write queries, we should be using an index. There should be an index that's being used. That, the indexes are used for a lot of different reasons, and the main reason as far as performance and tuning is, is faster processing of the data that I want logically in my query. 
So we got a slide coming up here about what if I see that my that my query is not doing an, uh, using an index on a table, it's doing a scan. Why is it doing a scan? And we're going to look through some bullets there. So index design is really important. DBAs create the indexes, but we know that we should know the application's workload. We should know how our queries in an application go after the data most commonly. The DBAs need to know this also. We tend to know it better because we're the app we're on the application side. Too much synchronous I.O., too many calls to DB2 from program logic. Synchronous I.O.s are those little singleton selects that come out of your, your, um, your programs sent to DB2 to return a record um, at a time. One of the things in batch processing that I find besides some bad coding practices is there's too many back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between program code and DB2. When your program code executes an SQL statement, that, execu that SQL statement actually goes to DB2, outside of your program, on over to DB2 where the SQL executes. The sending of that SQL statement has some overhead to it. So you want to do two and three and four table joins. You don't want to break them up into procedurally break them up in your program code because it causes too much back and forth and back and forth, what they call conversation between your program and DB2. The more conversations you have back and forth, the longer your programs run. So if you can redesign your program in such a way to minimize the, the times you go back and forth and back and forth, uh, I can pretty much assure you your program is going to run faster. All right, a few other areas. Sorts. If there are sorts going on in your program, know your data and know how many rows are probably going into the sort. Um, oftentimes I, I get into programs and I see the code and I see there's a sort going on and I ask the developers, like, well, on a typical run, how many rows come out in this result set? What's being sorted? You know, the more rows and the more columns you have, the larger your sort. So sorts are as expensive as your size. If I see a couple of sorts going on in a, uh, in a query, and I'm only bringing back a few hundred rows or a few thousand rows, that's not going to be the problem in the runtime. If I have a sort that's bringing back, you know, 125 million rows from a big batch process and it's all being sorted, that's going to have a little bit of overhead to it. So know your data, know what's coming out of your queries. If there's any sorts going on, know, know how many rows are going into your sorts. There's something called materialization. We get into this a lot in our advanced SQL classes. When you code nested and common table expressions, oftentimes there's some materialization of data. Sorts are a materialization of data. Sorts actually take the data that we queried, put it into a work file, sorts a work file, and then that's, out of that comes our final result set. There are things in queries that can cause some materializations in these table expressions. And not to say that that materialization is bad, but if there is materialization that's going on, and sometimes it's, very, it, it's a much better way to get the results that we want, my question always is, what's being materialized? You know, what, what's, uh, what's coming out of that table expression? Too much lock contention, we get into that in some of our other performance and tuning classes. Uh, locks can cause some, some wait times, you know, for our queries to get to data. Uh, we don't really cover that in, uh, in this uh, presentation today. Statistics out of date. You know, sometimes, uh, if, in a, especially in a test environment, if DB2 sees in the statistical information for a table that maybe it says it has 12,000 rows in it, but in actuality it has 12 or 15 million rows in it, then DB2 could choose a way to go get the data that's not correct to the amount of data in the table. So we need to make sure our statistical information is, is up to date. And like I said earlier, typically it is in production, not so much in test all the time. The wrong clustering order of data in a table. We're going to we have a slide on this coming up. Uh, this is something we developers should really pay attention to. We know our data a little bit better. One of the examples I'll, I'll, I'll talk about off and on here uh, during this presentation is um, the employee table. You know, in DB2 environments, there's a set of sample tables. And those of you that have taken some of our, our Themis uh, classes um, in the past, you know, we use these sample tables in most all of our DB2 classes. And why do we do that? Because these tables um, that we use have been around for 30-some years in DB2. 
They're listed out in every IBM manual, the SQL reference programmer's guide everywhere. Uh, there's examples of using these tables. If you Google things having to do with SQL, you're going to see examples based on these tables. So it's a great way to get to get familiar with these because you're going to see them, you know, often. Uh, so in the employee table that we get in our set of sample table that I'll show you in a little bit later slide, the data is actually in employee number order. So employee number one is the first row in that physical file. Um, is that the right way that that data should be clustered? We'll talk about that here um, in a few more slides. Okay, so just give you a couple of examples on some bad coding uh, practices. There, there's a lot of these out there. Take out any all scalar functions coded in columns in predicates. So you can see here it says where a year of higher date equals 2005. That year is what they call an SQL scalar function. Okay, if you say select year of higher date, that's not a problem. When you say where year of higher date, that can be a problem up until version 11 in DB2. Prior to version 11, those, those of you that are on, on uh, version 10 on the ZOS side right now, that is what they call a stage 2 non-indexable predicate. What that means is even if there's an index on the column higher date, by having a function, not just a year function, but, but any function on that column in your where logic, the optimizer is going to go, I'm not even going to consider that index. So it's called a non-indexable predicate. We want to write our predicates in such a way that to allow the optimizer to take advantage of any possible index opportunity. So we rewrite it like we did, where higher dates between 2005-01-01, So there's a, there's a handful of these that are now being rewritten by the optimizer in version 11. This one where you play, place a year on a date or a date on a timestamp column that will actually be rewritten as this between behind the scenes from the optimizer. So the optimizer is starting to do exactly what we as developers should have been doing for all these prior years. Let's go to the next one. The same thing with, uh, with mathematics. Um, this one, uh, this one actually should have been titled Take Out Any Kind of Mathematics on here. So this is a date mathematics, higher date plus seven days. If there's an index on higher date, the optimizer is not going to consider that index. So in this case, it would end up going to a table scan. So we rewrite it. We say where higher date is greater than current date minus seven days. The logic is the same, but I don't have any mathematics. I don't have any function on the column in the where clause. Now let me make sure we understand. This is this is this is coding in the where logic. If I said select higher date plus seven days, that's not so much of a problem up up in our query. What will really kill performance is when you put these functions on columns in your where logic, or you put mathematics on columns in your where logic. If you take a numeric field, say salary, and you say where well, salary divided by twelve, well that becomes a non-indexable stage two predicate. Stage 1 predicates process much more efficiently than Stage 2 predicates. Stage 2 predicates will never use an index. They become automatically non-indexable. You can, however, and in, in, in both of these platforms, we can create indexes on the RSQL expressions. In this case, higher date plus 7 days, or the year, or the R trim of something, you know, whatever functions we want to use. We can have DBAs create an index using, based on that function, called function-based indexes. So we want to stay away from that also. Here's a few of the things that are now being rewritten by the optimizer on the ZOS side in version 11. So a substring, if you, your substring logic begins in position 1, will actually be an indexable predicate. The date of a, of a timestamp column or the year of a date column, both of those will now be rewritten where a value is between column 1 and column 2. For example, where, you know, some 1900-01-01 date is between date column 1 and date column 2. Well, for those of you that are not on version 11 yet, if it's between those two, it's got to be greater than or equal to column 1 and less than or equal to column 2, and that's how we should really code it. But if we code it this way that we see here on the screen, that will actually be coded, just like I stated, by the optimizer. It'll put that value and say, you know, column one, um, 
is less than that and column two is greater than that. It's between those two columns. <laughs> so that's a good thing. The optimizer is getting smarter and smarter. The IBM is putting a lot more code in there to overcome these inefficiencies of the SQL language um, in, on these relational database platforms, especially DB2. So here's an example where, the, you know, I said where 1900.01 is between one date and another date. This is a visual explain that, uh, that comes out of the IBM Data Studio tool, which you can use on either platform, LUW or ZOS. And as we explain this, we see as part of the visual explain, over here to the left-hand side, you can see my mouse here, you see a folder that says stage two predicates. Okay? We don't want stage two predicates. Okay? Um, if we see those, we should try to rewrite them a different way. Not all stage two predicates can be rewritten more efficiently, but many of them can. And we see now a few of them are, are go going to be rewritten by the optimizer code in version 11. On the LUW side, what you'll see in the visual explain using the data studio tools, you'll see, you'll see categories of sargeable, non-sargeable, and residual um, that'll show up there. A little bit different terminology, the same idea. So by the way, if, if, if anybody has not done explains, or uh, there's, a, there's a number of different ways we can get explains out, this is a great tool, uh, IBM Data Studio. It's a free download. Maybe, uh, maybe you've seen it at your shop. Uh, a lot of shops have that. Some, some, uh, some shops, IT shops, don't have it rolled out to all the developers, but, um, um, and some shops have. Uh, it's a great tool. Uh, it's an easy way to do explains and to break up tables and look at columns and definitions and indexes and cardinalities and statistics and all that kind of stuff. Um, just a uh, just a really great tool. There's other ways to do to do explains on the uh, LUW side and the mainframe side in a non-visual way, and uh, and we get out a lot of good explain information. This particular tool, the Data Studio tool. Uh, goes into a lot more depth and a lot more information about what's going on behind the scenes in the execution of this query. So I know uh, I know we have a three-day Data Studio um, tuning class uh, that that is uh, that's quite popular out there for uh, for developers on on either platform. Okay, so tuning appro approaches. Okay, so we have a query program, you know, not running very well. It's up to us to try to start doing something with it. What can I do to get it to run faster? Where do I start? What do I look at? Well, do an explain. If any of you have not done explains up to this point, um, I would talk to your manager and have them talk to a DBA and get them set up to start doing explains. For whatever tool that they're doing explains at, at, your, uh, at your shop, there's a lot of different tools out there. They all provide the same basic information. You know, is it an index being used? Are the scans being done? What's the join order? What's the join type? Are there any sorts going on? It's just a matter of how you read that information out. So I know on big projects that I've been involved in um, over the years as a developer or big projects that I've helped run or being the technical specialist on the project, I make sure every person on that project has the ability to do explains, and they're set up. The DBAs have to, have to come into play here to get us set up. And I want them doing explains. It's real quick and easy to do explain and look for some obvious things. It's amazing, in my experience, how many developers in the world out there, they're not doing explains, or they don't know how to do explains, or maybe the shop's not allowing them to do explains because they say they don't have enough time you know, for that. But whatever you can do to start getting some explained experience, I would, I would highly recommend because it's, it's invaluable in trying to figure out what's going on with a query or a, pro, or a, a set of queries in a program that's causing some, um, some runtime that's, that, that's either an incident report or just some pain out there, the fact that it's running too long. Change the SQL. Rewrite the query or predicates a different way. Some predicates, we saw a couple of examples, could be rewritten differently. Sometimes we can change an SQL and totally write it differently with the same, with, and, and get the same logic. 
We do that a lot in our, we have an advanced SQL class that uh, changing the SQL and writing, rewriting logic different ways is a big part of that class. We go through some of our workshops and come up with three, four, five, six different ways to write queries to get the same results. So in order to figure out how to change queries sometimes, you have to be pretty knowledgeable in SQL. Um, that's where advanced SQL classes really come, really come in, into play or some education on how to rewrite queries different ways and, and, and logically get the same, the same answer set. So why is that important? Because sometimes writing a query a different way to get the same result set causes the optimizer to do something physically different behind the scenes in generating that result set for us. So if I can get the optimizer DB2 to do something different in returning my query, that's exactly what I want to do because I'm working on it because I don't like the response time we're getting right now. Redesign the program flow. Okay, this is, uh, this is one where, where I call it coding procedurally versus coding relationally. You know, don't break your joins up into, into separate tables. Minimize your back and forth and back and forth conversations for the number of SQL statements that you send to DB2. And we do that by making multi-table joins, maybe adding an exist, non-exist subquery, you know, as part of, as part of it. Um, you know, a lot of different things that, that you can do to minimize this. This comes up a lot in, the, uh, in our advanced SQL class also. The more you know how to rewrite queries different ways, the, the easier it is to redesign program flows. Besides poorly written queries that, that are not using the right indexes or doing table scans, the number one reason a batch jobs run too long is there's too much back and forth and back and forth conversation between your program code and DB2. So you need to think and code what I call relationally. You know, how can I get a lot of things done at one time as I send an SQL statement over to DB2 and get some, get some uh, data back? Statistics. There's a lot of things that we can do in statistics. We go over a lot of this in our performance and tuning classes. Uh, there's some general statistics that the DBAs run, typically monthly, weekly, quarterly on a production side. There are some very special statistics that can be run. Uh, that we may need to communicate with a DBA on. I have a slide coming up on that here in a couple minutes. And changing the physical design. Now, it takes a DBA to really change the, the, the clustering order of the, of the data in the table, but it's up to us to understand what is the clustering order of the data in the table and what really should it be. <clears throat> we'll look at a slide coming up on that also. So what causes a table scan? Okay, well, there's a number of things here. Um, you know, the predicates are coded in a non-indexable way. Functions, mathematics on there. DB2 says, I'm not going to use an index because you got functions or mathematics on there. Maybe the, uh, maybe the predicates don't match any of the available indexes. If I say where salary is greater than and bonus equals, if I don't have an index on salary or bonus, then DB2 says, well, I have to scan the table. I have no index that I can use based on the where logic that we have coded in our program. Maybe the table's small. And, and small tables, sometimes 10, 15,000, 20,000 rows, DB2 may say, ah, I'm just going to scan the table. That's small enough, I can scan through those rows pretty quickly. Maybe the statistics say the table's small. This happens often in our test environments. The statistics haven't been updated for months on a particular table in our test environment, and I think there's only 12,000 rows in there. But somebody's copied over a bunch of production data last so many, row, so many months, we have 15 million rows in there now. But DB2 still thinks there's 12,000 rows in there. So the optimizer code just looks at the statistical information, so that would need to be updated by a DBA to run run stats on that table again. Sometimes the predicates are such that DB2 thinks that a query is going to retrieve a large amount of data. This is the one time that a table scan can be really good for developers. If you're getting a large amount of data out of the table, sometimes, oftentimes, it's better to do a table scan. DB2 may choose a table scan even if, if we're only going to get 50 or maybe 30 or 40 percent of the data out of a table depending on our table size, DB2 says, well, if you're going to get 50% of the data, I'm just going to scan. I'm not going to use an index because it'll be faster. 
So in those times where we have queries that's retrieving a lot of data out of a table, a table scan can be much more efficient. And the, uh, the last couple of bullets here, um, the non-clustered index, that will come up a little bit later on a slide uh, that we'll, uh, we'll talk about then. Table space, out of shape, you know, DB2, um, DBAs, they run reorgs to keep the, uh, keep the data and the file in shape. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, they're usually very good about, about this. Sometimes they can get really, um, really bad, many extents. Um, data's been like, you know, added all over, all these inserts all over the table. Uh, that sometimes can cause a, a problem and DB2 is going to resort to a scan. Okay, so tuning approaches. Changing the SQL, we kind of talked about this. Can the predicates or the query be rewritten? Any combination of? Again, sometimes there's many ways to code a query and get the same results. They do not all optimize the same. So we as developers, we, we're empowered to do this. And, and I, go, I go and have done for like many years um, as a consultant on sites where companies will bring me in to do performance and tuning. They'll give me a set of programs or a certain application. They'll say, these things, we just need to get these things to start running faster. Will you take a look at them? I can tell you from my personal experience, probably 85% of the time that I get things to run faster, this is exactly what I do. I rewrite queries and I redesign the programs. So the largest percentage of times that I, in my experience, hit performance problems out on client sites, all I'm doing is changing code. So developers, we, we have, we are so empowered to get things to run very efficiently without getting anybody else involved. That's a great skill to have. And, and, and one way to really get there, well, there's two ways to get there. Become better at SQL programming. If you have not taken any kind of advanced SQL classes, I would highly recommend that. Performance and tuning explain classes. Know how to read the explain inside and out. And, and when you get those, those two things under your belt, you've actually just knocked yourself up a couple of levels when it comes to um, uh, development. So here's an example of changing the SQL. Here's, a, here's a, an example. All three of these will get the exact same results. This is just a quick example I wanted to throw out there. You can do an in subquery called a non-correlated subquery, an exist subquery called a correlated subquery, and oftentimes we, we do the two-table join. But we have to watch with the two-table join is sometimes there's a one-to-many relationship. So we get duplicate rows back. And this is the way that that third way is the way most of the time I find developers write their queries. And the first thing that developers do when they see duplicate rows out is they throw the distinct word in there. The distinct oftentimes causes sorts. If it's a really big query and it's bringing back, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows, you know, then maybe the other two ways above it is a better way to go about it, you know, without the distinct that's called that may cause a sort. Now, this is only going to be good if in this second table down here, this department table, we're not getting any data from. If I'm pulling data from that department table, I have to have it in the two table join. If I'm not pulling any data from that table, but I need it as part of my logic, then I have, I have the opportunity to move it into a couple of different subqueries. Okay, tuning approach, redesigning the program flow. I've kind of talked about this a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. What I like to see from programmers, uh, what I like to see out of their programs when they run, what went on inside the program? How many inserts, updates, deletes, selects, open, close, first, uh, cursors, fetches? What's going on inside there? I want those displayed out somewhere. So as those things run in production, we have a fallback. We have something that we can QA. And we can look at some information on what went on inside. If I see a program that did 300 and some thousand back and forth to DB2, if I can redesign that program in such a way to cut that in half, I guarantee you that program is going to run faster. So that's coding relationally and not procedurally. There's a lot of ways for programmers when they do mass inserts, mass deletes, or mass updates. There's a lot of different approaches to do that in programming code. So we need to know those approaches, you know. And one approach is not always better than another. There's always a lot of it depends. Minimize the number of times your code sends SQL statements. Take advantage of multi-row processing. Okay, multi-row processing, at least on the Z side, has been out there since version 8. 
Um, I know we have some of our programming classes where we go over the multi-row fetches, the multi-row inserts, and it minimizes that conversation back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I can go to DB2 and say, bring me 100 rows back, as opposed to going to DB2 and say, bring me one row at a time back. Because every time I bring one row at a time back, I'm going back to DB2 and asking it for another row. That's that back and forth and back and forth. For, for these programs that do a lot of singleton inserts or updates or deletes, order the incoming data. The file that we're reading in, order it either by the primary key of the table or by the index that's being used, you know, if we're doing an update, for example, or a delete. Um, Get that data ordered in one of those two ways is going to be much more efficient as you go through your, uh, your program processing. Okay, when it comes to explains, these are some bullets that we do on the explains. Are there any table scans? First thing we always look for as a developer. That's a real quick and easy. If that's the only thing we know how to do with an explain, that's a great thing to know how to do. Um, let's just look and see if there's a table scan. There's something called index scans, partition scans. Uh, how do I see if there's sorts going on? Um, materialization, what's going on there? What are my predicates that are stage one, stage twos? These all come out of these all come out of this information all comes out of an explain. So if you're not educated in the explain, I would try to get to a developer that is or someone that did, or or I know, you know, for us at Themis, we we do explain classes like all year round. Um, for uh, for developer to get them to get them educated on both the LUW side and the uh, the ZOS side. Statistics, okay. So I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about statistics. <clears throat> Are they up to date? You know, uh, do all the columns have cardinality statistics? Okay. For example. In the employee table, how many different department values are there in the table? How many different last name values are there in the table? How many different salaries are there in the table? Each of those are called column cardinalities. Those are really important when it comes to DB2 optimization and picking the right access paths. So we need to know your data. Somebody sits at a meeting and asks you, well, in this employee table, I know in our department master table, we have 107 different departments. But how many of those values are actually in our employee table? How many of those departments are employees actually assigned to? Do we have any departments that do not have anybody assigned to them? That's knowing your data. And that's where like analysts and testers and developers, um, I find sometimes are not as knowledgeable as they should be in knowing their data. The more you know your data, the easier it is to figure out some issues going on. Statistics. Okay. Just copying statistics from production to test, to me, is not good enough. I mean, it's a start. <clears throat> I like to have some tables in our test environment that has at least a few million rows in them. Because shops go, well, I can't copy all the data from production to test. Our tables are too big. But they can copy the statistics in a test environment and say, this table has 128 million rows. But we needed to have at least a couple or a few million rows. So as I rewrite things and I, and I test run times, I have enough data in there where I can see differences in run times. If I only have eight or nine or 10,000 rows in a table and I write my queries different ways, I'm going to be pretty close to my run times because there's not that much data in there. So let's make sure we get enough data in our, some of our test tables where we can really test as we rewrite things and redesign programs some before or after times. Hard coding. Know your data. So here's an example. So we as developers, we need to hard code at times. This is knowing your data. So let's say we have a status code value on a table and 90% of our data has a value of A. 6% has I for inactive. 4% has T for terminated. Active, inactive, terminated. That's a pretty skewed um, set of data out there for that particular value. If we use status code in our where logic, we should be hard coding this in our where logic. Where status code equals A. If I'm going after active rows, I want the hard coded A. And we need to then work with a DBA to make sure that DB2 knows in the statistics that 90% of that data is an A. If I have anything other than an A, because that's the, the 90%, then we code it up like number two. Well, it's, give me where I don't care what the status code is as long as it's not A. 
So that tells the optimizer goes, oh, A is 90%, so whatever you're getting is going to be less than 10%. So we code this way to like, I don't care how many other status code values they add in the future. I know that A is 90% of it, so let's let's kick at least let's kick A out of all those other values that we're going after. So we want to hard code and we want to work with your DBA on getting those statistics in the catalog tables for the optimizer. Physical design, okay? I'm just going to kind of go through here. We've only got a few minutes left. <clears throat> Here's an example of the way data may be clustered in our employee table. You can see it's employee, or employee number order, 10, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70, 90. This is the way it's laid out in the physical table. So what if I come in with queries often, and you can see along with some of this data, A00, B01, E01, these are called department codes. But what if I come in and I say, select from the table where department code equals D11. Where are all the D11s in this physical file? They're all over the file. They're not clustered together at all. If they were clustered together, that query would run super fast. The fact that they're not clustered together, if I have a hundred people that are part of D11, there could be behind the scenes what's called a hundred get pages from DB2. If they're all clustered together, it may be one get page. The less get pages we do, the faster our queries run. A page contains a number of rows on a page, as you can see these blocks I sort of have laid out here. So if we go after the data by department number order, if we join to this table where department number equals to department number, if I do a bunch of sums and averages and, and control breaks and all kinds of things on department number in my application, then this table should be in department number order, not primary key employee number order. Pay attention to that. Most tables get, get by default set to primary key order. There's so many tables that, that should not be in primary key order. And that can, that can cause a lot more physical I.O. in the running of your queries. Okay. I want to say thanks to everybody for coming today. A lot of stuff in uh, 45 minutes. Um, here's my email again uh, for those, um, if, um, those of you that have some questions here. And there was one question that came up on slide 15. What are nested table NTEs and CTEs? Those are nested table expressions and common table expressions. Those are things that you can code in the SQL language. <laughs> so we hope in these webinars that you have some takeaways. I think there is a few takeaways for, for each of you here um, today uh, throughout this presentation. Let's go um, finish up here. From, um, from a Thema standpoint, you know, this particular topic, we have a lot of classes that can back up a lot of these topics and takeaways in there. We have a DB1032, performance and tuning. We have a DB1037, query tuning using Data Studio. That's the Visual Explain tool. DB1041 is our advanced SQL. DB1051, high performance application design. DB1006, that's our LUW uh, query tuning using Data Studio. Okay. Again, there's, um, there's my email if you guys have any questions. Um, I can tell you from projects that I've been on, when, uh, when developers get educated in a lot of these areas, programming standards are in place, explains are put into place, program walkthroughs are executed, incident reporting stays low, most performances are minimized. So I'm real big on walkthroughs also. If you want a book with um, uh, SQL tuning tips, this, uh, this actually happens to be a book of mine. IBM Press picked that up uh, a couple years ago. Um, it's got over 100 tips in there, a couple of pages each tip. First couple of pages are the two tips I showed you in here. Don't put functions on your columns and predicates, and don't put mathematics on your columns and predicates. That is only updated through version 10. It does not have the new version 11 information in there. And here's our, um, here's our um, little advertisement for Thema Sync. Um, On-site, public, we do a lot of virtual classes now also. Here's our email, and I really just want to say uh, thanks a lot for everybody um, attending today. I hope you uh, learned something. I hope you have a good takeaway um, or two. Please email me if you have any follow-up questions, and uh, Happy New Year again to everybody. Have a great day.
Can we get a hard copy of the slides? Uh, yes. Uh, in another couple of days, go to the Themis website under webinars at the top. We should have the information up there by then. I'll stick around for a few minutes uh, just in case uh, anybody has another question here. And they, somebody says, thank you. Have a blessed 2017. Thank you very much for that. And you have a blessed one yourself. Uh, the book name again was DB2 SQL Tuning Tips for ZOS Developers. This is, uh, there's a lot of tips in here that are, uh, that are general to both platforms. There are some uh, very specific tips in here for the ZOS platform. So we put ZOS in the title. IBMPress.com, Amazon.com, either one of those, uh, you can find it. Okay, uh, Steve, uh, if you're still there, uh, as a developer, where can we look to see if a table or index needs a reorg? You know, that is something you're just going to have to check with a DBA on. There's, um, there's a lot of different things that people at DBAs at shops look at to determine whether a reorg is done or not. There are some, some um, what they call real-time statistic tables, RTS tables in DB2 now, that a lot of shops uh, rely on some of that real-time physical information that's, uh, that's updated during the day. And there's certain, uh, there's certain fields, columns in these tables, and certain algorithms that they run to really determine if, uh, if it's in bad enough shape that they need to do a reorg. So it's not a... It's not really a quick and easy one place, yes or no. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit involved, um, more of a DBA thing than a developer thing. But if all the other things that we looked at uh, we're not quite sure why, then we typically would go talk to a DBA and just say, hey, is there anything from your end that maybe might be causing this? And let them, uh, let them do their, um, their checking. 